people's platform join me on the people's platform this week as i speak to some of the most phenomenal international and local writers here in the historic city of gaul at the gaul literary festival Anthony Horowitz is one of the most prolific and successful writers working in the UK, having written over 50 books including the best-selling teen spy series Alex Rider, which is estimated to have sold 21 million copies worldwide and has been turned into a hugely successful TV series. Anthony is also an acclaimed writer for adults and was commissioned to write two new Sherlock Holmes novels, The House of Silk and Moriarty. He was also commissioned by the Ian Fleming Estate to write continuation novels for James Bond. Anthony's award-winning novel Magpie Murders was published in October 2016 to critical acclaim and was serialized at the beginning of 2022 with Leslie Manville in the lead role. It will be televised on the BBC later this year. Anthony is also responsible for creating and writing some of the UK's most beloved and successful television series. Hello and welcome to the People's Platform. The legendary Anthony Horowitz joins me today in conversation. Hello and welcome to Sri Lanka. Welcome to beautiful Gaul. It certainly is very beautiful. I'm very happy to be back. This is your fifth time in Sri Lanka. It certainly is. I've done three festivals and I've been here twice on holiday. Mhm. Mm um so As a writer you've ticked all the boxes you've been honored for the impact you've had uh, on the literary world your mystery novels are read by readers across the world um speak to us about how what your process has been in successfully navigating uh, through the different genres from uh, mystery novels to screenplays uh, specifically with regard to um the process of switching genres and mediums and the the creative process it entails but at the end of the day it all comes down to the same thing which is that I'm a storyteller I'm mm. always telling stories and what I find interesting about my writing is that whether I'm working in television or in books adult or children or theater or whatever it is I'm writing the same rules apply and that's all about um pace and uh, and uh, adventure and excitement and escape and and unpredictability and wanting to people to to be hooked into the story and i don't really consider so much oh this is television or this is this is book obviously different techniques apply but i like to think what what combines them rather, mm. rather than what makes them different and for me it is just simply about the joy of storytelling uh, and, and the excitement of gripping an audience and keeping them with me what draws you to these themes and is it also um something societally that we want to sort of move in to escape the 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 horrors of real realistic life I found myself as a writer when I was at school at the age of about 8 to 13 and uh it was a horrible school a very violent place I was very unhappy there I was an unsuccessful child in every respect and it was discovering the library in the school that actually changed my life I became uh uh a reader at a very early age and I found that books were the perfect escape for me. I've often said that a book is shaped like a door and it has the same mechanism as a door it opens like that and it takes you inside into different worlds. And so as a very young person I I found that I could get away from the school and all the nightmares of it and my own sense of failure and have adventures in my head. And and then the next step from that was realizing that I could tell stories to the other boys in the school. Everybody in this place it was horrible. We're talking about an English boarding school back in the 60s. This was not a place you wanted to be for any length of time at all and the violence and the cruelty of the place it's lives with me still but these other children were scared and lonely and 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 unhappy in there and so at night i began to tell them stories to cheer them up and i found i had a power the power of story and the ability to make friends through story mm. so that was where it all began for me and and to this very day i think you know you talk about magic and and things like that I, i've always thought to myself for the world as we see it can be a very very tough boring on a happy difficult place but it's always possible to imagine that just out of your sight just around the corner there's something else happening that is better that is more exciting with adventure is all around us mm -hmm. you know here we are sitting in front of this window and and my sort of mind says well, what's happening on the other side of the window mm -hmm. is somebody listening to us even now as we do this interview and saying why are we two people having this conversation outside mm -hmm. my room and what is going on in that room who are those people life on the other side of the glass is what i've been searching for throughout my career
you've effortlessly captured the young adult market and this gives you the opportunity to shape perspectives which is a massive power that you hold I think that I haven't shaped perspectives particularly I haven't set out to do that what I have tried to do in my work and in my writing and I think what I have succeeded in doing is to bring children, young people, two books. I mean, I've lost count of the number of mothers and fathers and teachers and uh, parents of one sort or another and, and family who said, this kid never read a book until he or she read Alex Ryder and now they've discovered reading. And the older I've got, the more I've come to realize how important it is that, that we should read, that the fiction has a huge part to play, particularly now in a world which is very difficult to understand, a world which seems very hostile and on the brink of something maybe quite catastrophic if we, if we, if we believe what the newspapers are saying. The value of reading, the way reading can first of all, as I've said, be an escape, but more than that, how it can inform and educate. You know, your story and my story are two stories that have somehow collided at this moment at this table. Where did you come from? Where did I come from for this meeting? That's what fiction teaches us. It allows us to see other people and to understand their ethnicity, their religion, their, 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 their beliefs, whatever it might be. And I think that one of the biggest issues we have in my country at the moment is a certain decline in reading, certainly in schools, the number of schools that don't have libraries or that don't have librarians who are so important to getting young people hooked into the habit and the practice of reading and all the joy and the pleasure that it brings. And, and as I've got older, that is the thing that I think most worries me about. Britain, that the national curriculum, our schools, just don't have enough time for the joy of fiction. Increasingly, the world we live in today is unforgiving and warring. How do we, as a people, cope? How can storytelling aid us in this process? Every single question about human beings and why wars happen and why people hate each other and, 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 and how you get through all that, all the answers are in fiction and in books and in great literature. I mean, I read Dickens and I read Trollope and, I, and many 19th century writers and also some great modern writers, some of whom are even here at the Gull Literary Festival, heroes of mine. And what the books bring me is this a sort of a softening, a sort of an understanding that, that just because somebody does something bad, it doesn't necessarily mean they're a bad person. There are always reasons. Monsters are always, have always started as children. You know, what is it that turns a baby, a child, into whatever monster you wish to name? And you're right in saying that the world at the moment is in a very dark and difficult place. And of course, reading books is not the answer to it. But were the people in power to have read books more and to have been more in tune with what being human means, maybe what is happening now would not be happening. Speak to us about the magic of writing Sherlock Holmes novels. I've always loved Sherlock Holmes and uh, when I was 17 I was given the complete collection of the short stories and novellas and that was what dis dis decided me to become a crime writer. Mm. Uh, Holmes and Watson represent the greatest friendship in British literature. That is the first thing to say about them. Of course, they're detective stories, but what Conan Doyle did so brilliantly was he was a, he was a gothic romanticist who painted an extraordinary world. How many writers can actually create a world that you can define in just three or four words? If I say to you, Growler, London, a Growler is a type of carriage, um, London and, and Fog, and maybe if I had in Stradivarius, you know where I am, mm. you're immediately there. And so you've got these two extraordinary characters in this remarkable friendship in 221B Baker Street. And when I was invited to write uh, a Sherlock Holmes book, it was an opportunity to, to live in that world, in that house, with these two extraordinary people for the seven or eight months that it took me to write The House of Silk, which was my first um, book uh, uh, based on Sherlock Holmes. And I loved every minute of it. It was, it was a, a, a great gift and a privilege to be given Conan Doyle's world and to be allowed to do what I wanted with it. But the one thing I didn't do was to break his rules. I did only things, my stories, both of them, that The House of Silk and Moriarty, live very much inside the world that Doyle created. And my job as a writer was almost to be invisible, to remind myself you're not as good as Arthur Conan Doyle. The only thing you can hope to do is to emulate him, to ventriloquize him, to, mm. to, to try and imagine how he might write if he were living now. Uh, and, and that's what I did. Thank you very much for your perspectives. Thank you.
the people's platform Madhura Festival for Arts, 1st to 4th February 2024, is a celebration of contemporary art, music and entrepreneurship. Visit its exhibitions, talks and workshops, community market and epic finale concert happening at Madhura Fort, River Market and University of Rohuna. For details, visit at Madhura for Arts on Instagram and Facebook. Media sponsors, TV1, Sirsa TV and News First. Education, an invaluable asset that can never be taken away from you. Laying the foundation stone for a new library building for the students of Nakia Denia Udagama, aiming to open new doors for a brighter future. Gamnanda, for the people, by the people. <laughs> Kehelia Rambukwala appears at CID following court order. Activists gather to demand Kehelia's immediate arrest. Health workers to call off strike. Trade union action cripples hospital activities. Sri Lanka's Online Safety Act published via Gazette. Ensure rule of law. Lawyers collective rights to Minister Tiran Alas. Is Ranil the next presidential candidate? SLPP lays down conditions ahead of decision. platform. Alexander McCall Smith is one of the world's most prolific and best loved authors. For many years he was a professor of medical law and worked in universities in the UK and abroad before turning his hand to writing fiction. He has written and contributed to more than a hundred books including specialist academic titles, short story collections and a number of immensely popular children's books. But it wasn't until the publication of the highly successful The Number One Ladies Detective Agency series that Alexander became a household name. The series has now sold over 20 million copies in the English language alone and since the books took off he has devoted his time to writing. Alexander has received numerous awards for his writing and holds 12 honorary doctorates from universities in Europe and North America. I'm so pleased to welcome to the show Sir Alexander McCall Smith. Hello and welcome to Sri Lanka and welcome Thank to you. Gaul. Thank you very much indeed. It's, it's a terrific pleasure to be here in Gaul at this uh, wonderful literary festival. Mm -hmm. You're a prolific mm -hmm. uh, fiction writer, also formerly professor of medical law. Mm -hmm. Speak to us about how these two areas intersect in your writing. Uh, firstly, from a personal level and also um, f from a, a justice perspective. Um, I'm interested obviously as a, as a as a lawyer, I was interested in issues of personal responsibility, criminal liability, liability issues in general, and uh, as you know, the law is full of um, interesting perspectives on these human problems. Uh, so it's inevitable that um, my writing should have um, had some of those influences um, in it. Uh, I think uh, also uh, in my previous existence, I was concerned with um, bioethical issues and some of the philosophical 
issues associated with medical practice and medical science in general. And uh, those are fascinating matters of social policy, ethical policy and so on. And that seeps into the, into the books, I, I think. One doesn't want to be too didactic about it, but it's, mm. it's there in the background. You're also the magical creator of the number one ladies detective agency series um, with a strong feminist protagonist. <laughs> Uh, speak to us about it. Well, the number one ladies detective agency series, I'm writing volume 25 at the moment. Mm. I never thought that I would uh, spend quite as much time with, uh, in the company of Precious Ramotsri and her mm -hmm. friends in Botswana, but um, I've become very involved in their story. Uh, I wanted to write about uh, a resourceful uh, woman in, in Botswana an intelligent and resourceful woman who helps other people with their problems um, because I've met people like that and uh, women in Botswana um, have had in the past to uh, battle against uh, patriarchal structures in in their society uh, and they've done they've done very well they're very resourceful and um, Mara Matsui is typical of that sort of lady who has um, carved out a career and, and, and done a great deal uh, mm -hmm. with, with her, her time. Um, now, is she a feminist? Uh, yes, it depends obviously on, on, on which particular definition one adopts of that, but certainly she's, she's very keen uh, that women should uh, fulfill their potential um, and she certainly would have um, little time for um, masculine attempts to limit mm. the, 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 the role, of wo role of women. So she, she's, not, uh, she's not a feminist in, in, um, in the sense of being um, opposed to or hostile towards men as such, mm. but uh, she certainly fights the, the corner of women, fights sure. women's, uh, women's rights. And of course tremendous progress has been made in many African societies with, uh, with that. That's on that issue. From a psychological perspective, part of the human condition is always mm -hmm. trying to solve others' problems without solving one's yes. own. Yes, yes. Um, how do you deal with this um, in your book? Well, it's a, that's a very interesting issue that you, you, you raise. I think for many of us, um, there are certain um, constant moral problems that we face in our day-to-day -day life, mm -hmm. uh, one of which is the extent to which we help other people. Uh, now, m morality is concerned with that obligation, the obligation that we have to, to look after other people. But there's a particular aspect of that which interests me, and that is how we limit the extent of our involvement in the affairs of others. Mm -hmm. Because if we contemplate the world, we'll identify many, many areas where help is needed, and many people who need our help Obviously, we can't spend all our time helping other people because that would give us no time for our own projects, our own ambitions. And so there is this issue about how do you define the circle of your moral concern? How do you say, well, I'll do so much to help and then beyond that I can't do anything? And for many people, that's quite a a difficult moral problem in their day-to-day -day life. Like you earlier alluded to, you have an affinity towards Botswana mm -hmm. and, and Western media, for lack mm -hmm. of a better word, mm -hmm. is keen to find economic pathology which exists but mm. there's also the good the beautiful the empowering yeah. that happens across Africa um, yeah. speak to us about this relationship affinity yeah. you have I think that if you if you look at the way in which sub-saharan African countries uh, have been portrayed in the press in literature and, and in various ways uh, there is a tendency for outsiders to to concentrate on things that are going wrong. Mm. Now that of course is, is, is what the media do anyway. The media are always looking for, um, I suppose, things that make news. And good events often don't seem to make news. People aren't particularly interested in them or they aren't as dramatic. And that can have the effect of distorting people's understanding of, of life mm. and that we think that all of life is composed of confrontation, failure, difficulties and, and so on. Now those things are there but they aren't the only story and there's a positive story as well and, and in many cases a very big positive story mm. that doesn't get a sufficient airing. Mm. And in my books in the number one ladies detective agency uh, I've never made 
uh, any secret of it, I want to talk about the positive things that I have seen in Botswana, which would be seen in other countries as well, but I happen to see them in, in Botswana. And those are success stories, people doing rather well with their lives, uh, people achieving things, building things, um, uh, often in rather difficult circumstances, and doing so with great uh, dignity and good humour, uh, which, is, which is what I write about. That's the area of fiction that I tend to be interested in. Now there is another story, and other writers can deal with the um, tragic side of life. Obviously that has to be reported upon and, and, and dealt with, but it's just a question of there being room in literature for different approaches. In a constantly warring, broken, fragmented world, mm. uh, people yearn for understanding, for love, for positivity. Yeah. And you make a conscious effort mm. to portray that yeah. beauty and positivity in your work. Well, thank you. I, I, I try to do that. Mm. Uh, and I quite agree with you that there's a very strong yearning at the moment uh, for peace and stability and, and for love to do its work. Uh, we, we see the consequences of the opposite. Mm. We see, as you say, this broken world and we see the tragedy of war and um, it's very easy to go down that, uh, that road um, but uh, people I think throughout the world are yearning for the opposite. They're fed up with conflict and confrontation and they want tolerance and understanding and a, a bit more positivity, actually. Um, you've also published two collections of poetry. Uh, this morning you penned a poem. Um, if you could just read a yes. excerpt of it. Uh, I, I, I do the first part of it. Uh, this morning I, I woke up and um, I thought to myself, I have to write a poem about water. And uh, staying here in, in, in Gaul, in the, in the uh, Gaul Fort Hotel, uh, um, so I got up and at the breakfast table uh, this poem came to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't say it was a vision, but nonetheless mm -hmm. it was something as I was looking out over the courtyard in the hotel. This is the first verse of it mm -hmm. uh, about, about rain and water. Mm -hmm. It falls as rain at times of its own determining, persuaded into monsoons in normal seasons, obedient to the patterns of the past but inconveniently at times, as if to prove that nature ultimately is neither a contractor nor employee, but a force. In veils or stair rods or metaphors less common, the rain falls across the waiting land. On highlands, on tea and eucalyptus equally, along the coast, on palm and frangipani, on paddy and rock, and winding roads that have nowhere special to go to. A country's reign is its clothing, its modesty, forgiving of past misbehavior or ingratitude, not interested in settling old scores, but beginning again each season as if nothing had happened. <laughs> Those are my observations on, on rain, and you can see where that's written uh, that I was thinking of where I am at the moment, so the reference to tea and eucalyptus and um, uh, paddy fields and so on. And uh, this is this landscape here in this part of, of uh, Sri Lanka, uh, obviously very conscious of water. Mm. Now, I, in Scotland, we have a house in the Western Highlands of Scotland. Mm. We're surrounded by water, very similar. We have very high rainfall. And so if you look out of the house, you see um, streams which we call burns in Scotland falling down the mountain with waterfalls and out of our front door we see the sea mm -hmm. just as you see it if you go down the road here and a liquid landscape is a rather is a rather nice thing and I respond very well to it and I've noticed traveling around here there's we see the uh, we, we see water waters waters very evident and um, water I mean it's one doesn't need to say how important it is to us, our relationship with, with water. It's all about us. We put it into our rituals. Mm. Um, water has a meaning beyond its meaning of liquid sustenance. It's yes. symbolic, 
we talk about forgiving rain, about rain cleansing, washing away sins, all of that. Yeah. So water has a lot of things to do. Before wrapping up, um, I'd like to ask you about your perspectives on um, how we societally, uh, what we need to do to cope with all the, the pain um, that we witness on a daily basis mm. across mm. our smartphones, um, yeah. warring worlds, but mm. they are the other, mm. the othering of communities. Yeah. And across the world, we see this indifference, normalization of hurt and harm. Yes. Um, institutions which look on unaffected. Yes. Uh, what do we do? It's exactly the question that I think so many of us want to address. As you spoke, I thought of a poem by that great poet W.H. Auden. Mm -hmm. he, he wrote a poem called Musée des Beaux-Arts and it's about a painting by Bruegel uh, which is in uh, Brussels and the first two lines he says talking about the old masters, the painters, about suffering they were never wrong, the old masters, how they understood its human position, how it takes place. And then he says it takes place while people are doing ordinary things. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, the, uh, the, the poem is about the fall, painting the fall of Icarus, right. where we see Icarus falling from the sky, right. but people are plowing fields, the ship is sailing by, doing right. nothing. And that really is what, what is happening. Right. So as you say, we see suffering all about us and we see distress all about us. Mm -hmm. um, not only personally, but uh, at the moment we, we turn on our smartphones, the images that come to us. And I suppose the, the only thing in those circumstances is to remind ourselves of, of the work that um, goodwill has to do and to, to, to try to um, apply that as far as we can in, in our day-to-day -day lives. None of us can wave a wand and sort out the problems of the world, but we can, at an individual level, uh, we can work towards um, greater understanding and, and friendship, and celebrate friendship. Mm -hmm. um, the, 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 the French uh, philosopher and writer Albert Camus mm -hmm. considered this exact question in one of his essays. He said, when we can't actually work out what the meaning of life is with a capital M and a capital L, mm. but what we can do is within limited context work towards positive, positive things. Mm. So in our immediate lives we can, we can try to do the right thing and most of us are we're flawed, we're weak, we won't always be able to do it, mm. but we can try to, to do that. <laughs>